Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's web conference, Global African Swine Fever Situation. Please note that all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We will provide you with instructions on how to ask a verbal question at that time. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit a written question, use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Choose all panelists from the Send To drop-down menu. If you require technical assistance, send a note to the event producer or call our help desk at 888-796-6118. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Liz, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Services Development Branch, and I'd also like to thank you for joining us for this webinar today. Our speaker today is Tony Pearson. Tony is an engineer and head of technical marketing for biosecurity and hygiene with Antec International, part of the LANCX group. Tony has held global roles for the business under DuPont, Camors, and now LANCX, supporting animal production across many markets and regions while leading LANCX guides in emergency disease control. In this role, Tony is working with regional governing bodies across many markets, such as China, South Korea, Japan, Colombia, Poland, Germany, Thailand, et cetera, as challenges arise. I will now pass the webinar over to Tony. Thanks, Liz. So, um, good afternoon, audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited back. And as Liz uh, kindly introduced, um, working here with, with Lanxus, we have a little bit of a speciality with emergency disease control, which is not a, a great speciality to have, but it is one that we uh, engage in. We've been working uh, probably from the memorable time of uh, 2001, the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Europe, and the avian influenza in 2006, which at that time we thought might be a pandemic. We've been working with the governments uh, ever since that time, and, and not just on a commercial basis. We work on, on training, um, and especially with the, the less skilled workers who very often get uh, brought in to be used, as the Army was in, in Japan and, and the first responders in, in Asia during the uh, avian influenza. Of course, we, we do have um, our commercial side as well, but today is not a commercial presentation. This is all about uh, African swine fever. As you can see from the, the pictures there, we've been involved with the African swine fever for, for quite some time here in Europe. In fact, this was back in 2012-13 when we had the first challenges, uh, announced challenges anyway, in Russia at that time. Unfortunately, the challenge got ahead of the disease. Um, simply, the, the contraction and the, the cross-contamination was, was really a, a challenge between the disease but also the politics. Uh, during that time in Russia, the federal and the provincial governments couldn't align on procedures. Um, they were choosing some pretty basic uh, acids to try and think of controls, and as you can see, that, that got into a pretty devastating situation. It has now, uh, um, I would say, been overcome largely. There were a couple of outbreaks. There was another one uh, in Russia this week, but typically that has, uh, has been overcome. At the same time, Europe has now been living with even influenza since that 2012 outbreak in Russia, spreading across um, much of Europe, but staying in Eastern Europe, except for a recent uh, challenge that came into to Belgium which was caused by wild boars having been brought from Poland um, across the borders. And since that time, that's already last October, November, we haven't had any outbreaks in Germany or in Holland, um, and it's stayed located in that Belgium area. If you just see that on the left-hand side of the page, that is just the outbreaks that have occurred during this uh, February month. What we can see from that is Romania has um, the only real challenges in backyards, while most of the contagion is still related, related to the wild boars. And it's pretty amazing that in um, Poland, for the last five, nearly six years now, they've had the challenge, but they've only had one commercial farm outbreak due to their increased biosecurity measures, which, which we can look at. Most of you will have heard of the challenges in China because they hit the press a lot faster. And that has 
led to e even continuous outbreaks, and this month alone another 9,000 plus pigs have, have been slaughtered. The, the worst case scenario has occurred, whereas Asia things have started to spread, and we found in Vietnam this week uh, three cases in, in backyard farms, but in the middle of the country which I think is a little challenging because if it's in the middle of the country, it means it's come across the borders. So there's a few cases that probably haven't been reported at this time. When we reflect on the challenges in China, I think it's worth noting that the challenge moved very, very fast. We had the initial outbreak in, in August, and within just a few months, we had a complete devastation across the, the country moving 2,000 kilometers in 20 days for, for, for a virus that is not airborne, that's a pretty uh, impressive movement for a virus and, and sort of condemns a little bit the lack of control that must have occurred on the pigs during, in China at that time. The, the Chinese, I was there uh, subsequently and I've been there consistently for the last 10 years and even though we've been doing training with FAO and, and working with the teams there, Still, the control going across the borders was a key factor, and unfortunately, it wasn't really absorbed. The big challenge we have now for the Asia spread is, unfortunately, from the Chinese uh, practices, if you like, because what we've been noticing, even the way, long way back when we had those early outbreaks back in Portugal and Spain, there was um, challenges from, from, the air, from the airports, from people taking this uh, challenges from one country to another in processed meat, that is exactly what has been experienced now coming out of China. We've seen in uh, Taiwan and South Korea in October and in November where they have found through DNA sequencing um, that the African swine fever in the sausage is brought into the country. So it's a really big wake-up call there that we really have to control food coming into, into the countries. Um, some countries do that quite well, and some don't do it at all. In the U.S., I think you probably know there are, there are dogs checking food coming in on some planes, but not all planes. Australia is pretty good. They, they more or less check everything, the planes and the hand luggage. But uh, with, these, with these increases coming from, from the tourists, as you can see there now, Japan added to that list, it's really a challenge if we don't control the food coming in and that food happens to get not eaten or discarded and gets into the animal food chain. It doesn't do that so much, to be fair, outside of China and outside of Asia. But if a backyard is fed, contaminated meat, the whole process can start to spread very widely. And we would think of uh, recommending with the government that I've spoken to, we're seriously thinking about checking those uh, border controls and making sure food isn't brought into the country. It shouldn't be, even if it wasn't African swine fever. Most of us were traveling on airplanes, fill out forms to say we're not bringing in food, plants, soils, but people do. And that really needs to be uh, one of the contagions. So the tensions are very high in Asia. I'm going back to uh, Asia the week after next. Um, we have to try and help the Vietnamese now because that's a lot of small farms, going to have some trainings, going to have quarantines, going to put some barriers in place. But really now people are starting to think about rejecting food imports, and you'll see in a moment because of the contagion that can happen in, in the, uh, the cooked meats uh, as well as live pigs and the contacts that we know of. When you see on the, um, the beaches in uh, Taiwan, the, the, the uh, boars dead on the beach, again, it's starting to spread across Asia. And that's dangerous for us because we have global tourism and pretty soon we're going to be visiting those countries um, on a tourism, maybe on a, a, a boating trip or a hunting trip or something like that, and then we're going to start running into, into high risk. In Europe, there's a continuous... Um, what I can say, seminars, continuous guides, and that's been going on from 2012 right up until the present day. We've got uh, all the countries involved, as you can see there. I just took a few examples from Estonia, Poland, Hungary, um, Bulgaria, Scotland now has also taken out uh, precautions. I was working with uh, one of the doctors up there, and we did some, some nice charts together so that the government could use those, and a lot of guides to try and help us. 
I think the U.S. is a long way away, but I think learning from some of these guides would be uh, pretty useful background information at least. And there's a very simple uh, cartoon type program, but it's on YouTube. It's uh, released by EFSA from the European Commission, um, and later these slides will be shared with you. So if you, if you want to just uh, take that reference down later, click onto the YouTube, and it's actually quite a good basic uh, education about contact, about uh, biosecurity in very basic terms, but everything seems to be in there that needs to be mentioned. And once we get that into a habit, we'll start to understand a little bit better how to, uh, to control the disease. Before we know how to control, we have to recognize. Not many people outside those contagious areas now have seen African swine fever. Some of the vets will probably think of it looking very similar to classic swine fever, which it does. It, in some cases, it looks like PERS. The, the ears are going that bluish color that we see. There's enteritis, very, very similar challenges. So any challenge that we get that we're not customary to seeing or that we're seeing in an unusual situation or circumstance, a different time of year perhaps to what we normally might experience it, that needs to be reported. Because as soon as we do get a challenge, we need to identify it very, very quickly. That is always the key. These are just some of the pictures of uh, the challenge. And when you look at those on the right-hand side, that could very easily be purred in that pig at the bottom and the enteritis and the inflammations, but, but all three of those are African swine fever. So unfortunately, the, the, the symptoms look very similar to these other challenges. So in, indeed, we, I would actually recommend um, a, a vet visit. One of the countries where they are looking at this challenge in an institution, perhaps in Poland, perhaps in um, Belgium or, or one of those type of countries where there is good biosecurity so that you can actually recognize and be sort of the leading person or leading vets that can actually spot this quickly uh, and help the government to, to suppress the challenge as, as soon as it arrives. When we think about the biosecurity, we think about hygiene. The first thing we always do from, from our perspective, whenever we're thinking about a pathogen, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a virus or even a fungus, is to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of that challenge. Whenever we are going to have to try and interact and um, inactivate the challenge, once we know the strength and the weakness, we can actually work very, very fast as well. But this is a very persistent, highly contagious, complex, uh, virus, but it's an en envelope virus, which is not typically something that we would think of as a massive challenge. But considering no vaccine has been created for the last 40 years, it must be pretty complex. In the UK, I understood from, from Herbright, uh, when I met with them uh, two months ago, they are break having a breakthrough, as they consider from a vaccine point of view. When they talk about breakthrough, they think in five years' time. So nothing is coming very soon or very quickly. We're also working with the, the institute in Spain who has uh, great knowledge and great experience with this challenge, not least because they had the challenge in their country for, for a fairly long period of time. And we're working with them on, on chemistries. Um, but it's, it's really a very persistent, resilient virus. And the challenge has been during this cold period again because it withstands low temperatures. It withstands fluctuations of pH from 3.9 to 11.5. That is not typical of an envelope virus. That is now behaving more like a non-envelope virus. And I think this is one of the challenges when we think about an envelope virus and we think, oh, straight away, even influenza, bronchitis, um, Newcastle disease, even in the poultry side, these are not difficult to inactivate, persistent, but not difficult. But this is a different type of uh, virus. So the survival of the virus is not just now thinking about um, in, the, in the environment, which it, which it can, 11 days uh, in, in fecal matter, etc. But if you take a look there on the right-hand side, you start to see the problem that if someone kills a diseased animal and processes it without cooking it to the right temperatures, the survival in dried meat, processed meat, is considerable. And bearing in mind those earlier slides that noted some of the sausages uh, being taken from China into other countries, 
they found the DNA of African swine fever, it would suggest that this has actually been around since before last August, and some of this processed meat has, uh, was already contaminated before the, the full notification, before the full precautions came into place. And if that's the case, then, then that is quite a serious challenge, obviously. We've also got uh, soft ticks that are carrying the disease. It's an arbovirus, um, unlike many of the other envelope viruses, and they, those can last for 10 years. Not a huge problem in, in many countries, but they can typically hide on rodents and, and compound the, the problem with vectors. But it has weaknesses. The incubation period of 3 to 15 days, and that pH, because we know its stability in 3.9 to 11.5, that's a little precise, but those are the, uh, the, the average figures that we get from just about all the journals. If we were to try and inactivate with a pH of chemistry below and above, we stand a much better chance of inactivating that quickly. And quickly would be the key when you think of the incubation period. So sustained pro uh, biosecurity protocols could uh, interrupt this incubation period. The virus itself is not typically airborne. So it's not like a PERS virus, which, which is airborne, or foot and mouth disease. It's not airborne. It's an arbovirus, so it can travel distances with the ticks. But the other thing to think about also is airborne if we aerosolize the dirt. So typically when you're doing washing and disinfection of vehicles outside, marketing vehicles, try and uh, contain that type of aer aerosolization. Sorry, large word the aerosolization of the fecal particles, because if they get into the air, then you do create an airborne challenge. Um, and that's not just with uh, African swine fever, of course, that's with uh, any type of uh, pathogen during that cleaning process. So as a contact virus, the main challenges are going to be vectors. They're going to be the pigs, wild boars, people, equipment, vehicles, dogs, etc. But also the hunting uh, community, um, as well as hunting being one of the methods that some governments started to use to try and uh, cull these, uh, these boars, you just see that picture and, and you can just imagine how chaotic that could be. It's unlikely that any of those hunters were disinfecting their boots before they went away from that uh, uh, massive enterprise. So they should, they should have some controls and some education. And part of that um, documentation you might have uh, remembered earlier from Scotland, they're starting to, to, to look at that. The soft ticks are not thus far in the USA or Europe of any major hazards, but they are in Asia and China. Rodents, of course, are anywhere, and uh, a dead rat um, lying around the ground, flies get into the dead rat, flies can get into the houses, so we have a lot of uh, potential risks. The inputs also to the farm. Previously, I was thinking that in Europe, this wouldn't be much of a challenge because uh, protein, animal protein is not allowed to be fed to animals in Europe. We're not allowed to feed waste food. But recently, there, there was a, um, a video conference uh, involving the, the German uh, pigs, and I saw there that they actually feed straw to the pigs because of the welfare situation, and they like to give roughage. That is now an input that I hadn't previously thought of when I was looking at the different inputs, which means those, uh, those stores are coming from potentially contaminated fields. When we see the Chinese and the, the, Europe, the Asians who dry their corn on the roads, that can also be contaminated by boars, so the feed can be contaminated as well. So there's a lot of challenges, but biosecurity can still uh, prevent and protect the farm. The responsibility is government. If there is um, a c compensation program in place, then people will report the challenge. If there's no compensation, people seldom report the challenge. The, the challenge um, notification in China came much faster after the government awarded 1,200 RMB per pig than it did before the government announced that um, compensation figure. As soon as they announced the compensation figure, the disease spread, uh, put two and two together, the disease was there before. So surveillance, the OAE, you can get weekly updates from there. 
They have a great site, OIE Weekly Updates on any of the search engines can tell you where the challenges are, where they're spreading. I'm sure you will have access to that. Training, education, and the refresher guides. Uh, I'll share some literature uh, places where you can go at the end of the uh, webinar, um, but you can just Google online African Swine Fever today and you'll find a lot of guides and a lot of advice. The data reviews when the virus is available to test chemistries. If we're going to use chemistries, we want to be sure that they are proven against this virus. And as I said before, this transparency with the compensation is really the biggest key factor that I could uh, describe to governments. Fast action with the most suitable tools is the key to prevent the spread of this challenge, as we've seen in Eastern Europe where we don't have the commercial farm outbreaks. These are just some typical pictures again of some of the guides just to give you uh, an outline of those things. Uh, whichever one you look at, you can go on site, as I said, you can find some great uh, support. They are um, verifying each other, if you like. Wagenen from, from Holland and the one on the right-hand side, they're all mentioning the same vectors, the same biosecurity risks that we think about day by day. The soft ticks and insects are probably an extra that we would think about, and certainly we don't continually think about wild boars as a challenge. And unfortunately, when we see some pictures in a moment, you'll see how far those wild boars have been spreading around the world, and that's now quite a considerable challenge. As I mentioned, the hunting, this really needs thinking about. If you um, do have the misfortune to have a disease next year, or we hope not, I think it is controllable where it is. I don't think it has to transfer across uh, oceans. It can only be taken by people, if, it, if that's the case, or food processes. But hunting is quite a thing. Um, I've been a bit shocked by the, the pictures that I've seen, and we've reached out um, with the, uh, the U.S. Uh, embassy in Poland and the U.S. embassy in Bulgaria. They've been advised, advising the hunting parties to think about disinfecting their clothing and their boots before they go home. The hunters of um, organizing those trips are now supplying um, uh, Tyvek coveralls, so they're quite comfortable. Um, they're white, so they blend in with the snow when, that's, when there's snow, and they've also got green ones that blend in with the countryside when it's not snowing. So people are taking precautions, and I think that's going to be um, a major step forward uh, to reduce that particular challenge. As I mentioned, the soft ticks, I think I, I need to put them into the slides simply because they, they do exist. Um, there are some in the USA, there are some in, um, uh, in Europe as well, and Russia. I haven't seen them as a major vector, and I've been looking at this challenge and working with this disease for the last five years. But effectively, um, I don't think it's a major thing, but literally be aware of it. And certainly, if you get these soft ticks, they will uh, latch on to, to dogs, to cats, as well as uh, rodents. So, again, it's all about what's uh, running around the farms. So we come to the wild boars. When you look at those pictures, that the large green area is the wild boar uh, population, the circulation, if you like, across Europe and Asia into, uh, into Australia. And we have there in the, in the USA, uh, the East Coast and some there on the West Coast. More highlighted in the, uh, the USDA 2018 uh, summary in the, in the purple. And if you look across to the right, those little black dots, that's the wild boars in, in Europe. And we think about Spain, which is the largest uh, pig producer in Europe, that would be devastating. And they are already looking at uh, border controls. They're trying to take special observation. But there, is some, there are some loopholes. The, the wild boars can cross in, in quite a few areas. And looking at the top in Asia as well. There was some talk about culling in different areas. Um, that's going to meet a welfare challenge. If you've ever seen small wild boars, they almost look uh, cute enough to be pets, and that's definitely going to create a welfare challenge. So catching, contagion, uh, culling is, is probably necessary at some point to try and reduce those, uh, those large volumes, especially if this starts to uh, spread in, in, in any future countries. Just wanted to touch base again on the um, the actual uh, the inputs that I mentioned in that other slide because this was was only new to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, if you look up on the left-hand side, Denmark, Germany, uh, all now using roughage as part of the welfare systems to feed the pigs. But then when I looked at um, the, the, the wild boars in the, in, the, in the environment, you can see the pictures. Those wild boars have come straight from the harvest, and they're running away from the harvester in the Czech Republic. So there's a direct correlation between wild boars and the grain and the, and the straw. As we get into the winter, away from harvest, of course, the challenge reduces because the longevity of the challenge is less. But still... That presented itself as a problem that I hadn't previously um, encountered, and so we're going to have to think about um, disinfecting those inputs coming into the farm. But still, they have to be then uh, eaten. So that's, you know, that's not, not the easiest um, uh, challenge to overcome. Drying the, gri the grain on the road roadways, that's not going to stop. That's basically um, a potential risk, and the idea is that they, they should keep some guards there to keep away wild boars while they're doing the drying. That's pretty much okay. They can do that. The, the families are really working hard on that um, as an extra tool. So feed is not expected to be fed in the USA or, or in Europe. The risks are clear where it is permitted. Um, we're not allowed to feed uh, waste food to, to backyard farms or to hobby farms um, in, in Europe. I'm not exactly sure of the, the restrictions in the USA, uh, but in Europe they can. Uh, think about stopping that type of thing because even in the feed, you're not allowed to put meat and bone meal from, from animals into the feed. Asia is a different case. And when you see uh, pots of uh, meat being cooked in such a way, and then you try to think about, oh, if it's 70 degrees, it's fine. 30 minutes, inactivate the virus. But what you actually find is even if that is boiling, we put um, those cooking thermometers into those pots, not those exact pots, to be honest, but very similar pots. And what we found is that there's um, a lower temperature at the base. The top is boiling, but they're not all 70 degrees. So even if they're thinking, oh, my gosh, it's okay, I cooked it, it's, it's okay, we can now process this uh, into, into sausages, into meat, basically you can't. Once the animal has a contagion, it should be culled and destroyed of in, in the proper way. So biosecurity is going to be uh, an increasing, uh, what I call, practice. The Chinese biosecurity has what I say, gone leaps and bounds in the last four or five months. We've seen very fast building of barriers. We've seen wheel dips, uh, vehicle sprays, uh, people controls, and uh, many of you have been to China. They do things very fast, very quickly. They just put great investment into it, and now some of them have got some really tip-top biosecurity entries and, and barriers. Because whether we have small farms or big farms, and that is the challenge, we have to make sure everybody follows the process. Um, otherwise, we don't really have a biosecurity environment around us. And there, the wild boars can come in contact with the pigs. The pigs will go to the same market. They can get to close to the same vehicles, and the process starts again. So biosecurity now in those areas has increased dynamically. I think... Why wait until you have a challenge? Increase the biosecurity anyway. Um, that's easy for me to say. It's not always easy in practice when the farm is struggling to uh, produce pigs at a, at a price that costs to the consumer more than he's actually paying for his feed. And I see in a lot of countries over the last three or four years where the farmers are pretty much on the breadline from that point of view. So biosecurity is the key, and we have to keep teaching that and, and trying to get that education through. I'm not going to go into all the different uh, parameters of biosecurity, simply because by the time you think about terminal biosecurity, if you've already got African swine fever, it's in the farm and you're talking about decontamination and, and that we could look at. Um, reducing pathogen pressure during the cycle is a completely different um, aspect and not completely relevant to, to African swine fever. For African swine fever, the most important thing is the barriers. We can stop this disease coming onto the farm. Pigs cannot fly. I know that's a comical uh, cartoon on the left-hand side, but this isn't uh, a comical situation. 
But unlike avian influenza, where you put up barriers and you put up great controls at the gates, the wild birds fly over. In this case, pigs cannot fly. And that is completely relevant because you can put up good barriers. You can put up uh, uh, fencing, preferably double fencing. Even in Denmark, they're now putting a, a fence between Denmark and Germany, right the way across the, uh, the borders to, to prevent uh, wild boars. In Germany now, each province has governments working uh, with the federal state um, in the provinces, allocated uh, teams to look at where they can conveniently put fencing so it's not totally obstructive, but to try and herd these animals into the right type of situation. Um, the pictures at the top, very simple um, cattle grids. Uh, my farmer happens to be one of those, but we, we just do that and, and prevent um, the animals coming in off the moor, but they work very well. And as extra barriers, they could be quite a, um, a tool. When we helped design some of the, the barriers recently, uh, we looked at double fencing with cattle grids. Um, this is a, just a typical design. You put up double fencing simply with an area in between where you've got wide enough to do the brush cutting. This keeps down rodent activity. It also gives you a very clear vision if any of the fencing is challenged. Double fencing because wild well, boars, if they, if they know there's food inside, they, one fence may not be enough. I've seen them moving pretty fast, pretty, pretty tough looking critters. Um, not the most uh, attractive animals that you, you'll see running towards you, and a double fence would be, um, would be ideal. In that situation, you've obviously got to have the good biosecurity. You've still got to have rodent controls. But around the outside perimeter there, you'll see that we actually thought about um, an alkaline barrier as well. Remember when we look at the weakness of the, of the virus, it's inactivated or um, it's unstable in a pH above uh, 11 and a half. So we create an alkaline barrier with agricultural lime. The incubation period is 3 to 15 days. It is possible that we can actually uh, reduce the, the risks of incubation in that area because we've created that alkaline barrier. It's not a new idea. This idea is also done with, with foot and mouth disease, especially in large, large swath areas like uh, between Venezuela and Colombia. We, we put some lime on the grass there to try and reduce the airborne challenge uh, coming between those two countries. Again, it's this part of the program, part of the biosecurity. Uh, this is just a, a repeat of that, just to give you an idea of, of how simple this is, but at the same time, very uh, useful. Spreading this agricultural lime, creating that alkaline barrier, it's what we normally put on mortalities anyway. To, to make them decompose faster, creating that barrier, but of course, only when you get a challenge. You're not going to do this unless there's a challenge in the area. So coming back to the actual biosecurity, um, we're thinking about uh, uh, trying to break the transmission, and the only way we can break the transmission is with hygiene. There is no vaccination for African swine fever. Medication, by that time, it's too late. Genetic resistance, no. And housing and management is part of the barrier controls. But we have to think of hygiene for barriers. Of course, end of the cycle, decontamination, if that, if that bad situation uh, happens, then um, the, the product challenges will, will come. But the barriers is the, is the main key factor. When we think about the choice of disinfection, of course, as farmers, we'll always think about uh, the price and the supply relationship. But in any, any choice, it's always the pathogen that has to be the first. In this case, the African swine fever is the predominant pathogen, but we would never disinfect just for one pathogen. So we have to think about what other challenges we have coming to the farm as well. And then the season and temperature, uh, the chemistry is available and the contact times all have to match. So you have to have a chemistry that inactivates a passion by proven independent data at the contact time that's available on the surface that you're trying to disinfect, whether that's a vehicle or a boot dip or a concrete surface, all of those will dry at different speeds. And then think about the temperatures, because some chemistries work less well in cold weather than warm weather. And we know the virus survives longer in colder weather. So you've got to have the contact time with the chemistry to inactivate the challenge. The pathogen list is a very simple tool. 
Um, we have to have a return on investment, of course, and, and the supply relationship is where you get the products. So all those things are key in your normal hygiene and biosecurity, as is understanding the pathogen. And in this particular case, we're, we're focusing on the African swine fever. But at, at the same time, it would be wise to look at all the other challenges that you have, whether it was Pseudomonas, whether it was Staphylococcus, um, whether you have PERS, something that does all these challenges at the same time would obviously be uh, a better return on investment and a way to build up a biosecurity barrier for the future. I'm sure many of the vets here have seen this typical chart, harder to kill, easier to kill. There's nothing that's easy to kill in my opinion, it's just that some things are less difficult than others. We always put the envelope virus as the least difficult but African swine fever is behaving, as I showed before, is behaving like a non-envelope virus, especially with its uh, pH uh, stability area. This is another slide which shows exactly the same thing, but if you look at those uh, envelope viruses which we're used to, like PDV, the PERS virus, much less stable. 5.5 to 7 pH, most chemistries will inactivate those in a reasonably good contact time. But African swine fever is pretty close to a PCV2 stability. And we know that PCV2 is also difficult to inactivate because of its stability and because of its uh, complexities. So we really have to think about uh, choosing the right uh, chemistry to inactivate those challenges. When we think about chemistries, we have every choice available. Everything that's available from aldehydes to quaternary ammoniums to oxidative chemistries, and basically you've got to have a look at the data, and as I said, make sure the data, the proven independent data, matches your temperatures, matches your surfaces with that contact time. Not forgetting that there is now uh, pathogen resistance, not virus resistance, it's only pathogen resistance from bacteria so far to quaternary ammoniums and aldehydes. Um, Staphylococcus, Pseudomonas, this type of thing, which, which you can easily um, uh, track. If you're not uh, clear on those, um, they're not completely relevant to today because they're normally bacterial resistance, and you can just put into any search engine pathogen resistance to those chemistries, and you'll see within a few seconds, 20 to 30 seconds, you get a, a huge amount of hits that, that, that will guide you on that. Phenolic chemistries uh, and oxidative chemistries, at this point in time, there are no known pathogen resistance, so your bacteria and your viruses are uh, basically covered at the same time. But think about that chemistry and, and not just the product, think about the blends and how that works, especially we haven't finished the winter. Uh, we're having an incredible heat wave here at the moment in the UK in February. Yesterday was 20 degrees, today is 16 or 17. Unbelievable for, for February, but typically this would be a colder period. When I'm going to reach uh, uh, Japan uh, towards the, the end of March, it'll still be cold. China's going to be cold, um, and we have to think about the chemistries that work better in the warmer weather, which are aldehydes and quaternary ammoniums, they work less well in the cold. It doesn't mean they don't work, it just means you need to think about the extra dilutions that are required and make sure that data you get, as I said, matches your temperatures as well as the uh, environment. Uh, I'm sure most of you know the EPA registration for temperatures is 20 degrees, uh, and then you can become on the label for uh, an inactivation but you don't typically have 20 degrees this time of year when you're thinking about disinfecting vehicles outside. So that is something to bear closely in mind. And can lead to some of the typical cross-contamination hygiene experiences that we get. So again, think about that chemistry, think about the cleaning and disinfection and uh, all those challenges that you might have. You have to use the right level of disinfectants. I'm seeing a lot of people using disinfections in, in Asia, but at the wrong volumes and the wrong concentrations. So we're getting there, but it's still an education process, and, and I hope that you guys will uh, take that on board as well. As I mentioned about the barriers, because of their importance, if you do have cold weather, there are ways to overcome that. You'll see in the bottom left-hand corner the chemistry uh, for that particular um, Arc spray is inside the house, so it kept warm uh, going to the outside. The top farms are in, in warmer parts of Asia. 
And if you're having wheel dips, make sure they're long enough for the largest wheel to pass through. A typical, very simple but typical challenge in China, the wheel dips were put in just too short. They don't cover the four wheels or six wheels coming in from the vehicles. And again, think about those cold temperatures. Don't forget the inside of the cabs. The people have to, uh, the drivers have to go through biosecurity barriers as well as the vehicles. And we can give lots of guides. There's lots of help for that type of uh, uh, challenge. Um, again, think about the chemistry, the surfaces. I can't impress that enough. Barriers is the key. Yes, we can get fomites, we can get rodents, we can get flies, we can get uh, certain birds eating, like vultures, eating the um, uh, dead carcasses and then defecating inside the farm. We can get exceptional challenges, but if we keep the barriers correct, we should keep out the challenge, and that is proven in, in Poland. The, the people is the, the next big thing to, to train. Uh, you have a lot of um, different versions of, of foot controls in, in the USA. I've seen dry foot baths. I've seen uh, various challenges. Um, I was on a, uh, a call last time with one of your uh, eminent scientists, and, and they showed through video cameras people using precautions, not using precautions. If you have African swine fever, you, you better hope that everybody's doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And where's the right time to start? To start now. Don't wait until you've got the challenge. Make sure people understand the pathogen challenges carried on cotton, on hair, on skin. Get those uh, biosecurity protocols, comfortable showers in place. Cleaning boots, yeah, it's a good idea. Actually, changing boots completely is even better. And that's the legislation that we have here in Europe. And as I said, don't forget the drivers. When you think about changing the boots, I'm sure you've seen the Danish system that's at the top left-hand corner there, and you can see on the right-hand side, it doesn't have to be a complex system, it just has to be a, a barrier, um, a, line in the, a line on the ground isn't enough, it has to be a physical barrier for people to take notice. There are those various options, foot mats, foot dips, walk through foot dips, walk through people, sprays, every little helps, but the most conclusive is taking boots off and putting boots on and changing your clothing. Um, can't impress that enough. We, we really want to make sure that that's up to date now and that actually will help your entire biosecurity, not just thinking about African swine fever. So from a quarantine point of view, um, certainly if you have any challenges, if you've got any animals that you're thinking sick, that you're not expecting, lock down the farm. No movement to any animals, call uh, your senior vets, get some qualification, get some serology tests, make sure, diagnose what you've got. If you've got it, let's hope you don't, but shutting it down as fast as possible is the best way to stop it. We had a foot and mouth outbreak here in the UK in 2007. We stopped it in three months, which was a lot better than the effort we made in, in 2001. So speed is the key. Um, as it is with mortality. When you have mortality, this needs good management. Those are simple pictures that come from my, my typical biosecurity presentations. When we have animals, they should be disinfected when they're moved. The areas where they've been moved from should be disinfected. This is a typical biosecurity. Um, the vehicles or the equipment that we use should be sprayed and disinfected. These are key things. We don't know why those pigs have died immediately. Leaving them lying around for diagnosis is one option, or disinfect, move them away to a quarantine area, uh, will reduce the cross-contamination. As I said, that is for all biosecurity, not just for African swine fever. We don't want to get to the situation like this. Nobody wants to have this de decontamination. I've seen 6,000 pigs piled up and burnt and smelt that awful experience. In, this is not just in Russia, this is in Romania, now in China. Nobody wants to see this. No farmer can bear this. This is really uh, a shocking uh, thing, and I think that's, uh, I don't have any disrespect putting these pictures up. This is, this is how bad it gets. And if it, if it scares people, that's what it's supposed to do, because nobody wants this, uh, this challenge. From us, I won't stay on this page too much. I don't want to commercialize things, 
but from from the Langsas, if Vercon.com, there's a lot of guides in various languages. There's Spanish, there's Chinese. Um, I'm giving a speech in, in VIV. Uh, next, uh, two speeches actually next week, the week after next, sorry, in VIV, and then for Peak Progress. But there's some great recommended reading there too. The wild uh, pig management from, from the USA on the top left, and then there's a second uh, pig management uh, down on the bottom left. There's some great books from the FAO. Even if you think about the contagion that they had in Africa, and that's been updated in 2017, this is experience. This is small farms, backyard farms, and a lot of experience talking about how to overcome these challenges. One takeaway I would suggest is really consider the difference between avian influenza and African swine fever. Even if we call them both envelope viruses, they're not. The African swine fever is behaving more like a non-envelope virus than an envelope virus. Um, I'm in discussion now with the, with the government in Germany because they have simply put on their website on the DVG envelope virus as though the same challenges will uh, occur and that the same chemistries will inactivate. That's not the case. We need to be a little bit more precise and think of those more as a non-envelope virus. So hopefully that's going to be uh, moved across uh, on the DVG guide. It's, it's really taking this level of education and, and understanding, and I think we got that in Poland. As I said, that's a great test case of consistent, continual challenge, but without the uh, commercial uh, disease outbreaks. If you imagine 60 to 70 wild boars a month, in eastern Poland, which is a pretty dense area for pigs as well, one commercial outbreak in the last uh, three years. So, coming to the last uh, the last slide, um, basically, there's no vaccine. So this is the first time we've probably been faced with a virus for several years where there isn't a vaccine available now, and it's unlikely that there'll be a vaccine within the next two to three years. So it's the BBB. It's boars, control, track, and monitor the wild boars in most countries because they are the biggest challenge. Uh, barriers in being prepared and the biosecurity. There's no point waiting for African swine fever. Upgrade the biosecurity now and that will actually give a return on investment. There's quite a lot of documents now showing the return on investment of biosecurity and now is the right time to do it. Don't wait until the African swine fever hits. Um, with that, I'm just just about on time. Sorry, I think I'm a few minutes over. Um, but with that, uh, we'll open the floor up to to questions. Thanks, Tony. That was that was great. We do have some um, written questions that have come in during your presentation. Um, I think we're going to start out with those. Um, first question is: Have there been rigorous surveys in Eastern European countries with ASF and wild boar to see if soft ticks are involved? Uh, sorry, you're, you're breaking up a bit there, Liz. Is it, is it possible to put the question on the screen so I can answer, or is that not possible? So you can, you should be able to see it right there in your chat box. Um, um, hang on a sec. I'll just go out of there. Um, so let's try and read the question again. Have, have there been rigorous surveys in Eastern European countries with ASF and wild boar to see if soft ticks are involved? Um, yes, and the soft ticks have not been involved in Eastern Europe at this time. Uh, the, what they have found is a lot of rodent, uh, rodent cross-contamination. Um, they've started doing some extra uh, rodent controls, actually, um, and that seemed to be the, the biggest challenge. The, the wild boars, because they are in some of those remote areas, they are pretty much, um, they die of the disease. They're not just being culled. Uh, to give you an example, in Belgium this month, out of the 66 cases, 65 were actually found dead uh, and uh, not shot or anything, just literally found dead. And unfortunately, those get scavenged. And it's then the scavenging from, uh, from rodents, maybe wild dogs, that become even more of a challenge because the barriers, not necessarily, that have been put up to, to control the, the boars are controlling the rodents as well. But to date, in, certainly in Poland, Belgium, and Latvia, we haven't had uh, the soft ticks. In China, I, I haven't been back to China for nearly two months, 
Um, I'll, I will check, but I haven't heard of anything there either yet. Okay. The next question we have, is there any evidence of viral attenuation over the last 10 years or so since ASF was introduced into the Caucasus region? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry, sorry not to be able to answer that. Um, as, as, you, as you introduced on, on the call, I'm, I'm not a veterinary. Um, I'm, I'm an engineer on, on biosecurity, and I, and I haven't, uh, in the papers that I've read, I haven't heard of anything like that, but I can't say that that's not the case. Okay. The next question we have is, could this be a situation where irradiation of feed inputs may reduce the risk of contamination? In, in certain situations, I, I, I think so, yes. Um, in, in Europe, we're not allowed to feed uh, the protein from animals to protein. So we can't feed meat and bone meal previously from, from slaughterhouses of cattle or pigs or sheep or whatever to other cattle, pigs or sheep. So we do have some restrictions on that. The, the grain that I've seen in, um, in, the, in Asia going being swept up and put into the bags, I think after a period of time, because of the incubation period of the virus, because of the longevity of the virus, uh, it, needs a, it needs a protein source. Um, I don't think the survival will be too great in there, but certainly treating with a, uh, a propionic acid, for example, to bring the pH of that feed down to a certain point. Remember, we've seen the weakness there, 3.5 to 11.5. If we can bring um, uh, the acidity level down, to, to a certain point, then, then certainly we would control that challenge. We could, could control, but that potentially um, other uh, bacterial challenges as well. The next question is, take may not fly, but has anyone looked at mechanical movement of the virus across the landscape by vultures carrying eating birds feeding on carcasses? Uh, yes, I did touch on that actually. Um, anything that's scavenging um, could effectively do so, yes. Because if that's eating, if you imagine the, the vulture is eating uh, contaminated meat, then the defecation from that vulture will be contaminated. And we have 11 day um, recorded life of the virus in feces. So the worst case scenario is the vulture eats the dead boar, flies over your farm, defecates or, or lands because you have outside water or outside feed available, um, defecates and you walk through that defecation or that defecation becomes in contact with your pigs. That is a potential uh, fomite, yes. The next question is, have avian vectors been determined to be a source of ASF transmission? Uh, people. So, so far, from a vector point of view, people have been uh, the worst in, in China. Um, they don't have the same controls that we, that we do from a point of view of a shower-in, shower-out system. They, well, I should say they didn't have. They, they do have an improvement in that now. And the other vector would be the, the, the vehicles. But if you're thinking of specific vectors like flies, um, ticks, rodents, cats, dogs, from that perspective, nothing has been identified as the single worst, but people and uh, vehicles have, have been cited as the worst cases, but that's not untypical for emergency disease control. According to WHO, 65% of emergency disease are transported by uh, people and vehicles. We have another question. Um, can you please advise on how manure and bedding are being managed on the infected premises to inactivate the virus? Survival in protein-rich environment is very long in addition to difficulties with cold temperatures. EU methods of keeping manure and holding for 42 for 42 seems insufficient. Yes, it seems to be um, that once they have, because you're, you're talking about from the from the decontamination point of view, once you have the virus on the farm, uh, the farms are not being uh, rehabited uh, for a period of time. But again, I'm not sure that's going to be long enough. Going going to your to, to your question. Um, they are using uh, chemical substances. They're, they're trying lime in, in the liquid manures. They tried um, uh, heating the system, and I don't think any of those is, is effectively going to uh, to destroy. Um, in three farms that I visited, they actually buried the the fecal matter. Um, uh, that was quite a job, as you can imagine. Um, but the, the, the choices were very limited. 
Um, you, you can't use most chemistries in that type of, of situation because of the organic challenge. Um, raising the pH or lowering the pH to a certain level, that was tried with, with lime um, and citric acids. Didn't seem to have uh, enough uh, um, derogation of, of the challenge because when they took swab samples, they still found uh, the virus. So it's, it's a great question. It's a challenge that we have to try and overcome from a decontamination point of view. Uh, of course, the best thing is don't, don't get the disease. Use biosecurity to keep the disease out. But that definitely is a major part of the decontamination. And at this point in time, the, the best recommendation is to do burial. The next question is, has the EU placed any import restrictions on animal feed slash grain from China due to a biosecurity, due to biosecurity concerns? Um, I'm not sure if the UK government has, but I know Thailand, Malaysia, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan have all um, banned imports of feed goods from China. Okay. Um, I wish I, I, I don't I don't wish sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you sorry I don't wish bad on um, the Chinese exports but at this point in time if if they can't control what's coming out then then we shouldn't accept it. Correct. So obviously, good biosecurity is essential. One of your slides mentioned how many hours viruses survive, virus survives on hair, skin, etc. I'm wondering how much risk these areas are for spreading the virus. How infectious is the virus? Does it take a large viral dose or a small viral dose to infect the pig? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a contact challenge mostly. Um, I think the, the, the worst case scenario would be those hunters, those hunters that have come into contact with the saliva and the bodily fluids of the dead boars certainly be a much higher uh, level of contagious challenge on their clothing. Um, but if you've got a backyard farm and you've got a worker, uh, one of the team that's actually got backyard farms that have had the challenge, and he comes or she comes with uh, infected clothes, you, you, you're basically going to have a challenge. I mean, that's you've got to have cloth, uh, uh, the fabrics changed, any clothing, go through the shower in, shower out process. Um, that's the best way to stop that challenge. You're definitely going to have potential disease risk through the clothing and contamination. And, and I'm not sure if you can remember on the slide, there's, there's one there that actually has the cap. And I've seen this, to be honest, in the U.S. as, as well as other areas. Somebody does a great biosecurity. They put their cap on the desk, and they seem to pass through the barriers, and they put the cap back on. Everybody seems to have a favorite cap. And when we swabbed the cap, we showed the, the guy how much challenge was on the cap. So it's really one of these things you have to be uh, strict with. And that's not just African swine fever. That's E. coli, salmonella's, any type of, of challenge. Sharon and Sharat has been shown time and time again to, to, to reduce these challenges. We have another question. It says, do we know why this envelope virus is so tough compared to other envelope viruses? Uh, the complexity of the virus, um, d d personally, I, I don't know enough about veterinary science uh, to, to understand the complexity, apart from the fact that I know it's complex. The institute in Spain, as I said, they've been working on this for 40 years and they haven't come up with a, a viable vaccine. The serotypes mutate and change, there's 12 different types, and it seems to be as soon as they get um, a vaccine that can, that can uh, hit work against this challenge, it changes. And it changes to the, to the point, it only changes every couple of years, but if you, if you know anything about the, uh, the vaccine, how long it takes to produce and go through safety and go through R&D, every time they catch up, it changes. That is the, the, the brief description that came from uh, the eminent professor in, in Spain. But certainly you can go online and, and check with the Spanish Institute. They have some great data and background there. Perbright have said they think they have a breakthrough, but what they call a breakthrough is a vaccine in, in almost five years still. I spoke to them last year, so it's, it's just around four, four and a half years now. And they call that a breakthrough, which is a long way off. Next question is, did the speaker say that, soft tick, that the soft tick has or has not been found in China and Asia? Uh, but they haven't. They, they do have soft ticks in uh, in Asia and in China. The actual um, the soft ticks are there, but they haven't been itemized as a uh, cross contamination challenge. 
that what what I mean is there hasn't been a reported case where a soft tick has led to the African swine fever virus that they know of. And normally when a soft tick um, beds itself in, the, the, it would stay there for, for a couple of days um, and they would have seen some, some evidence because there's obviously the pyrethroids that we have to put around and, and insecticides. We've advised them already to use uh, the insecticides as part of their biosecurity to try and prevent that challenge, um, but we haven't seen a report of a direct correlation between a soft tick and one of those outbreaks so far, but they do have soft ticks in those areas, yes. The next question is, do you have recommendations to eliminate viable virus in large quantities of manure slash urine from infected animals contained in lagoons typically found on large-scale swine farms in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, that's very similar to the, to the earlier question, uh, Liz. Um, at this point in time, no, we don't have um, a way of understanding how to inactivate virus in such large volumes. On the decontaminated farms, they have buried uh, the, uh, the manure so far. Um, I need to, to reach out to the farm that did decontamination in Romania a couple of weeks ago. They weren't sure what they were going to do. They thought about the burial situation as well, but that was going to create, they thought, a, quite a toxic area for, from the soil for several years to come. And they were trying uh, different ways of trying to either increase or decrease the pH of, of, that, of that situation, whereas organic matter is typically a neutral pH. But at this point in time, no, there hasn't been a successful uh, recommendation, I would say, that you could say, go out and do this, it works. We have another question. Has compost been used as a method of inactivating the virus in either the carcasses, feed, or manure? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It's not a t I know composting is a typical uh, practice in the USA, Brazil, uh, I was in Peru last week, and, and some other South American uh, countries and, and a little bit in Australia for the poultry uh, farms to, to reduce their challenges between cycles, but we don't see composting as a, as a typical uh, resolution in uh, Europe or in uh, Asia. Our next question is, do you know how long infected farms are being left free as pigs before restocking? Uh, so far, three months. That's the typical guide from, from OIE. Um, but again, it depends, I would imagine, on the, the pressure in the environment. Because if you've had an outbreak, you have a three-kilometer zone and a ten-kilometer zone of observation. Uh, within the three-kilometer zone, they, they have been uh, started to restock the farms that were contaminated last August. Um, they started that around the end of January, so they did leave it a little bit longer, actually, maybe four or five months. But the, the initial guide was, was to leave them uh, three months. But again, it depends on the, the, the volume and the pressure within that kilometer zone and how fast that's, that's moving, because it had to be three months clear of the, of the zone. Our next question is, you've talked about fences and gates from a scale of 1 to 10. How important is fences for biosecurity for this disease? Uh, biosecurity, fencing is, is important for biosecurity 9 out of 10 for all disease. You have to stop people and you have to stop um, stray animals, anything you like coming onto the farm. When, whenever we look at designing biosecurity protocols, a perimeter fence is, uh, is the first thing we put up. Okay. Uh, the next question is, could ASF virus survive in human nostrils and be spread to another swine premise if multiple farms are visited within 24 hours? Can you, can you just repeat the first part of that, Liz? Could ASF virus survive in human nostrils and be spread to another swine premise if multiple farms are visited within 24 hours? Well, the typical guide for um, anybody visiting a farm is 72 hours to have a gap between farms. Uh, that's a typical biosecurity um, guide. Um, I think minimum would be 48 hours. So we normally say 72 hours. You have to sign the book going in to, to say you haven't been on the farm previously. And in the shower in, shower out system, you, you would be expected to do a thorough wash and clean. Um, specifically, 
Um, yes, it's it's a it's a warm environment area. I I will hope for the person's sake that he's not in that much contact with with African swine fever. That if if you were, I mean, it's hard to imagine the the answer to the question, Liz, because if you just were amongst contaminated pigs and then you thought about travelling and visiting some more pigs, then 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 you shouldn't be in biosecurity or, or basically doing the veterinary practice. I don't think. You should. You really should be more uh, cautious than that. Absolutely. Uh, we have one last question. Is China using Vircon as a disinfectant? Is it available there, and are they using it in cold weather? Um, gosh, that's a commercial question. I hope that wasn't one of my team that asked that question. <laughs> um, uh, so basically, yes, they, they are using um, copious amounts, to be fair. Um, we, we, we've moved 900 tons of, of Vercon into China in the last month to, to help them. As you can imagine, they have very large farms. Vercon is not affected by uh, temperatures in, in the same way as the other chemistries. So the data that we have for African swine fever, for example, is at 4 degrees uh, centigrade. We can uh, reduce the temperature of the disinfection solution by adding monopropylene glycol down to minus 10, which doesn't affect the efficacy. So in, in that particular situation, um, uh, as I said, I hope that's not one of my team, but that is a commercial answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> Do we have any verbal questions? Because we have, we're done with our written questions in the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move to Q&A, please feel free to place yourself into the question queue by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and question. And we do have a question on the line. Paul, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Uh, this is Jean Bonatel. I was wondering how long the Af African swine fever persists in the burial holes. Um, in, in, in the source of, of, of protein, ma'am, it's going to stay there for, for quite some time. Um, obviously, with, uh, uh, with that protein source, I would say in, in the burial, we would put on lime. Uh, to try and change the pH of that environment and hopefully for a, a faster decomposition. But um, I, would, I would expect it to, to, to reside there for two to three months. And I think that is why the OAE came up with the, the three months of uh, evacuated premises before allowing more, more animals back on. Is somebody checking that or no? Oh, oh, uh, yes, yes, they are. Um, they, 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 do, they do check that, yes. Um, the, the decontamination with the wild boars has been checked in, in Poland, and so far the virus was surviving more or less 40 days um, in, in, the, in the, what they call the light burial areas. Um, in the reading material that's in that, um, uh, one, or two, one or two of the last slides, you'll see there's an FAO guide on carcass management and burial systems as well as decomposition systems. And that's a pretty good guide for, for small farms with, with the lime, etc. And in the big burial grounds, they are burying them, to be honest, I would say very deep. Uh, the last one I saw in Romania was nine foot uh, before the top layer of soil was, uh, but it was nine foot between the, the pigs and the top level of, uh, of topsoil. I do have another written question. Um, is there a requirement in the EU or individual member countries for a hunted wild boar to be tested for ASF? And if so, are all hunted boar or a representative sample tested? Gosh, I didn't quite get that. There's, is there a wild boars that being tested? There is a surveillance of wild boars in, in all the European countries. Um, anything that then is found uh, positive is cold, um, but the, the dead, there the, are the more dead ones than there are um, surveilled ones. What, what was the next part of that? Um, if, if they are, if all are hunted, if so are all hunted boar, or is it a representative sample that are tested? No, it's typically um, a representative sample that's tested. The idea is, is to try and reduce the hunting. The hunting tends to spread the boars. Um, as you can imagine, anything that's being hunted runs away. And the hunting is trying to be restricted into certain areas, which are 
uh, I don't, I don't know, the word control sounds a bit bad, but into controlled areas, which means it's, it's not quite so much of a sport as, as it should be. But the, the danger is that they're worried that if they go in and do a culling process, the boars will just scatter and then they're going to start spreading much faster. What is very noticeable in Poland, for example, um, Poland's quite a big country. The pigs crossing the, the, the country, the wild boars are still, after five years, only the wild boars that have been infected and surveillance is done all, all across the country is in the east and the northeast. They haven't spread, they haven't um, migrated, if you like, across the country. <clears throat> and the fear is that if they started to do a culling policy, that might stimulate them uh, moving more widely, in which case Germany would start to become at risk, which is not that much at risk at the moment. So it's an interesting question of how to try and uh, reduce the numbers, and I think that will um, be deliberated, and, and I think there will be a lot more work done on that, especially in, in uh, areas that don't have the challenge yet. Okay. Do we have any other verbal questions in the queue? Once again, ladies and gentlemen, pressing pound two on your telephone keypad will place you into the question queue. Okay, well, we're just about up to our hour and 15 minutes for this webinar. And we, do uh, we don't have any on the line. It's we do have a question on the line. Okay. Yeah. Well, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Kim Daphne, I was wondering if there's an intensive educational um, push at the international airports, um, both in Europe and um, across the globe. Um, no. And, 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 and to be honest, I'm loving every time I, I, I travel a lot. Last year I took 80 flights around the world uh, doing my job. Um, and I'm loving it every airport, to be honest. Uh, not, not for them to have our product, but simply to have uh, some beagles and, some, and checking some food. I actually came back from China through Helsinki to London, and uh, we went on a transit. Um, as we passed through, the, the lady in front of me, was, was her bag was checked, her, her food box was opened, and inside were some little pork dumplings. The, it was closed and given back to her, and she carried on walking into Finland with the pork dumplings she just brought from China. So there really isn't a very good level of awareness of this challenge. Um, I have been speaking with uh, with the USDA departments in, in the Polish uh, U.S. Embassy, and they are really uh, conscious about the hunting side, but not, not from a, um, uh, a flight point of view. In, in my opinion, without being uh, racist to the Chinese people coming, I think their flights should be checked first, uh, and the beagles should be deployed straight away for their flights. This is, this is not... Um, um, scaremongering. It's literally, they have been, the DNA has been found in the sausages going to Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and Thailand. And without being scaremongering, also, my personal fear is that we have a virus that has no vaccine. Previously, when we've had those sort of challenges, we haven't had a high level of the population consuming pork, in this case, that contains the virus. How long will it be before that virus starts to become zoonotic, which it's not at the moment? And then we would have a real challenge because we would end up with a zoonotic virus with no vaccine. So I think it, it is really a serious situation. And going to your, your, your point, which is a great point, I think border controls need to be much tighter in general. We do have another written question. Um, is rodent control recommended on farms that have been depopulated for ASF in order to prevent the virus from moving out into surrounding wildlife? And are there over other bridging wildlife concerns on ASF positive farms? Um, the beginning of that again, Liz, sorry, it just cracked up a little bit. Okay. Is rodent control recommended on farms that have been depopulated for ASF in order to prevent the virus from moving out into surrounding wildlife? 
Yes, I, I, I think it's it's um, it's an interesting question. But rodent control should be practiced as a biosecurity measure on all farms all the time. It shouldn't just be waiting for a virus or a bacterial challenge. Um, rodents are very clearly uh, carriers of so many different types of disease, from E. coli to Salmonella to viruses, to PERS virus. So. And there should be no excuse not to have rodent controls all the time on all the farms. It shouldn't just wait for a decontamination situation. The second part of the question is, are there other bridging wildlife concerns on ASF positive farms? Um, yes. I mean, basically, when the farm is, is on lockdown, there would be um, uh, the decontamination process going on, and while that process is going on, then probably wild dogs or even normal dogs moving around and, 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 and tracking the stuff. But other animals, uh, typically birds would probably stay away, especially if they start uh, burning carcasses or, or burying carcasses and things. Vultures not. Vultures would come as your, as your earlier questionnaire, questioner uh, mentioned, uh, so they would be potential carriers. Okay. We have one last question. Um, is there a reason that you may be concerned that this virus may become zoonotic? Well, simply, um, I don't have enough skill set, to be honest. Um, other than a personal concern, I read a, um, a book called um, Spillover from David Quammen, and he actually predicts, uh, it's about 10 years old, that book, and he predicts uh, such a similar thing could occur. What, what really confuses me, Liz, is going back to the other gentleman or lady's question, that why has a vaccine not been found in the last 40 years for this challenge? Is it so complex, and does it, has, it, has it got the ability to keep changing its typing so much that if we now have a situation where, for the first time, I would suggest, people are potentially consuming the virus on a regular basis. Could that then have a challenge of genotic presence? How does genosis occur in the first place? You know, those are, those are scientific uh, questions that I ask. I don't know the answers to. But I do feel concerned about that, having read that uh, documentary and that book. Well, we've had some great um, comments also that came through telling you how what a wonderful presentation it was. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Tony, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to present today for us. Um, You're welcome. I'd also, I'd also like to thank everybody that joined into the webinar. And um, also be sure to watch your email for additional webinars that will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. So with that, I will wish you a good afternoon. And uh, thanks again, Tony. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone, for listening. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.